This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. This week, I'm going solo again. I like these uh, deep dives into the the classics. Uh, What we're going to be covering in today's episode is the contributions of Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises on monetary theory. But then also, I'm going to address a very popular, nowadays on social media at least, objection to the standard economist story of the origin of money. And so specifically, I'm going to be reading from David Graeber's book, uh, which you know is quite popular in uh, heterodox circles for people who want to critique standard economics on this issue about where did money come from. Also, the MMT camp uh, rely on this type of critique of standard economics. All right, so that's what we're going to cover today. Before we get into that, though, it's just some housekeeping. Let me mention the Mises Institute. It's hosting an event in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Saturday, September 14th. This is 2024. The theme is going to be living free in an unfree world. It's going to feature Peter Klein and Ryan McMakin discussing the challenges of creating a free world through markets and other private institutions amidst ever-growing government power. The registration is $60 per person and includes a catered lunch. If you're interested, go to Mises.org slash NM24. So again, that's Mises.org slash NM24 to get tickets for the Mises event that's going to be in Albuquerque on September 14th. Okay, so for today's topic, as I say, uh, let me first go over Carl Menger's explanation for the origin of money. And so here, uh, just to place this in the history of economic thought, Menger had the the entry for this in one of the like Encyclopedia of Economics or Social Sciences. I forget the exact title of the volume, but the, the idea being this isn't just something that Menger wrote in his own books that, you know, we Austrians look back to fondly and say, ah, look at this, Menger had a good thing. Like it was recognized at the time that, ah, yes, Carl Menger here has provided a very comprehensive description of this is the way economists of his day think that, you know, money emerged spontaneously, if you want to use that word, uh, and that it wasn't a creation of the state, okay? But it's Menger didn't invent this on his own that, for example, Adam Smith has a very similar account in his own writings, obviously writing well before Menger did. All right. So uh, even though Austrians think of this as Karl Menger's theory of the origin of money, especially outside critics of economics who want to say, no, 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 this is a bogus history. Don't listen to those economists. They don't just have Karl Menger in mind. They have a, a broader target, if you will, because again, it wasn't just Menger. It was Smith and some other classical writers who wrote things along these lines, all right? Whereas Menger's, you know, I think his account was more rigorous, especially in light of our modern utility theory and so forth than what Smith wrote. Okay, but all that housekeeping aside, where did money come from? So the the problem here is you might think, oh, well, there must have been some wise king or maybe some, you know, group of elders of a tribe or something just got together and said, hey, you know, the current way we're doing things here with just using barter uh, is rather inefficient. And why don't we use something like money? And there's problems with that, because for one thing, we don't have a a record historically. You'd think if somebody invented money, you know, that person might be remembered and revered. There's no such record. Uh, But perhaps more fundamentally, the problem is if you hadn't grown up in a society that used money, the concept of it's kind of weird, especially if it's a fiat money, right? If it's if, especially if it's something that serves only that particular role and it doesn't also serve as a regular commodity, you know, the idea that, oh, hey, how about instead of everybody just engaging in trades where you're giving up something you value a little bit in order to get something you value even more and then vice versa for the other party, instead of doing that, how about every time you want to trade something away to get something more valuable in your estimation, what you first do is you trade it away to somebody who gives you something that you actually don't value at all directly, that serves no purpose whatsoever. But then why would you do that? Well, hey, if we can all agree collectively that anytime we want to sell something, we'll take this other thing in exchange, even though none of us 
directly values it at all, gets any benefit from it directly. But if we can all go along with this system and then, you know, we each in turn accept this thing that in and of itself is kind of useless, we'll all be better off. Okay, everyone, let's try to do that. You see how kind of, you know, that would that would be ridiculous, right? If you had a bunch of people, for example, who had never used money and then, you know, they're trading horses for berries and wheat for uh, apples and so forth, you could explain that. But then someone holds up shells that they picked up on the beach and say, hey, hey, hey. Instead of you selling, you know, that amount of wheat for some apples, why don't you sell it for these shells that are completely useless to you, serve no purpose whatsoever. But if everybody else takes shells too, like this, including the person that sells apples, see, you can get what you, that would be kind of nutty, right? And then beyond that, beyond just the problem of how would you get that up off the ground, in the beginning, how would people know how many apples to sell to get a shell, right? How would you know what the purchasing power was of this thing that, you know, was going to be the new money in this society. Okay. So Menger just, you know, kind of went through and, and explained this. These are some of the difficulties with a theory of the origin of money that assumes some wise individual or group of individuals just kind of figured it out on their own and then implemented it. You can see how that would be difficult, you know, for them to even stumble upon the idea and then convince everybody else to go along with it. And then on top of that, how would they know in the beginning what, ratios, you know, exchange ratios to assign to the various other types of goods and this new thing that they want to christen as the money. Okay, so that's the difficulty with just brute force explaining it as, you know, some wise human invention. Okay, so the but problem still though for from the perspective of like the social sciences is clearly money did come from humans somehow, right? It's it's not like if you see a tree and you say, hey, we have no record of a human inventing a tree. Well, that's not, a, you know, a, a, a stumbling block because <laughs> whether you think God created it or you think uh, the universe just sprang into existence for no reason on the Big Bang, whatever it is, you don't need as part of your story that somewhere along the way humans created trees. Whereas with money, clearly human agency had to be involved somehow. And yet we've seen if you just try to do it directly by saying some human invented it, and got everyone else to go along with it, that doesn't quite work. Okay, so what was the story Menger told? He gave a step-by-step -step account by which a group of people collectively, um, each acting in his or her own immediate self-interest, engaged in actions that eventually gave rise to the emergence of a single commodity that became what we would now call money. And, and but yet nobody along the way in that process was consciously trying to create money, all right? It just sort of emerged spontaneously. Um, it was like an emergent phenomenon, if you're familiar with that term, all right? So specifically, Menger's story goes like this. Let's imagine we've got a community in the beginning where they do have private property, like each person owns certain types of goods, uh, and that they can trade with each other. Okay, so you may, maybe people go down to the the market or something in the town square, and they and they exchange. Obviously, this story is going to be very simplistic and not it's not a, a genuine historical narrative, and that's going to be one of the objections that somebody like David Graeber is going to bring up. And I promise, you know, at the end of this episode, I'll devote time to his critique. But for right now, let me just acknowledge Menger wasn't offering this as, hey, this is literally what happened during this time period. He's just trying to walk through the logic of. This is how it could have emerged, and I, as the social scientist, do not need to posit any sort of superhuman wisdom or, you know, any kind of leaps in the story that jump over some difficulties like, well, how would they know what the exchange ratio should be? Okay, so that's the, the function of this narrative. Okay, so um, there would be, you know, exchange ratios of various goods for each other, but also, besides just knowing the relative market valuation of goods, like to say, oh yeah, this many apples trades for that many oranges or, uh, you know, one horse trades for this much tobacco and, you know, so forth, or an hour of this person's labor trades for six hours of that person's labor, you know, those types of things that also different items would have different degrees of, uh, it's, it was translated, you know, cause Menger's obviously not writing in English. The, the version I saw was translated as sale ability 
but we might think of it as marketability or um, maybe even liquidity, right? There's different ways of of translating, you know, what he was trying to get across. But the idea was, if you hold a, a certain type of commodity, not only can you evaluate it in terms of, hey, what can this fetch in the marketplace? But you also can say, how hard will it be for me to find another trading partner who would give me that for it, right? And we see this distinction, um, again, like in our modern parlance, probably the word liquidity is what captures this this idea. If somebody says, um, you know, what's the market value of this suitcase that's got a thousand one hundred dollar bills in it, and say, oh well, the, the market value is a hundred thousand dollars, and let's assume that the authorities aren't going to come and arrest you and seize it because, well, geez, someone walking around with that much cash wants to be a drug dealer or something, even though that is what would happen. But just go with me on this one, right? You say, oh, that building over there that you own, that you live in, that house, what's the what's the market value of that? And let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars, okay? Um. Nowadays, that would be like a kitchen, but go with me on this one to keep the numbers simple. So even though the market value of that suitcase full of $100 bills and of that house, we could say in both cases, is $100,000, the suitcase full of cash is obviously more liquid. And what do we mean by that? That immediately this thing is worth $100,000, whereas the house, you couldn't tomorrow transform that house you know, sell the title to somebody else and have $100,000. When we say a house is worth $100,000 or, you know, typically nowadays a lot more than that, that number means if I engage in, you know, I I clean the place up, I market it, I stage it, I have uh, uh, open houses and viewings, I put it on Zillow or whatever, I get an agent to work on my behalf, right? So you have to find the right buyer. And we're saying for normal, you know, for the standard type of marketing in this industry that's commonplace, after a month or two, you could probably locate a buyer who would give you that much money for this. That's what we mean when we say the house is worth that. Uh, Another difference would be something like shares of corporate stock. You could say, oh, right, I have right now a bunch of shares in the S&P 500, various companies. And someone would say, well, how much is your portfolio worth? And you could say, oh, looking at today's prices, my portfolio right now is worth $50,000. So those assets are, are very liquid as well. They're not as liquid as the suitcase full of cash, you can't go to your grocery store and spend a share of you know Google stock, but you can pretty quickly call up your broker or you know go online and do it that way and transform your holdings of major corporate shares of stock into money in your checking account that you can then spend at the grocery store. Okay, you can do that pretty quickly. So so notice the shares of stock could could change in value pretty quickly, but the point is when you want to turn your shares of corporate stock into cash, you can do that quite quickly, all right? So there, again, usually the term we might use is liquidity to explain that distinction. So between market value, so you could have a house, shares of corporate stock, and a suitcase full of cash that are all, quote, $100,000 worth of those various things, but they would each have different degrees of liquidity. So Likewise, Menger was focusing on the fact that um, you could have a horse, for example, that has a high market value, but it's relatively illiquid or you know unsaleable, that it would be difficult to find somebody. If you say, oh yeah, this horse is worth whatever, 5,000 apples, it would be hard to find someone who could pay you that, or you could make it more realistic and, and break it up and to say, oh, this horse would trade in the marketplace. If I wanted to sell this horse, I could get this many apples and this much wheat and this much tobacco and da 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 and go through all the different things you could trade the horse for. But that doesn't mean if you actually had the horse and wanted that stuff within the next hour, you could just trot down to the marketplace and and do it, right? Because you'd have to find the people that had those respective things. It'd be hard to actually consummate those transactions. Whereas if you just had a bunch of eggs that people thought, oh yeah, that those that amount of eggs is worth about, you know, a hundred oranges. It wouldn't be as difficult to go make those, those trades to, to consummate that. Okay. So that's the idea. And so some things like a telescope, for example, I think that was an example he may have used. It's got a high market value, but it's very illiquid where it, its degree of saleability is quite low. You would have to search long and hard 
to find the appropriate buyer who wanted your expensive telescope. Okay, so once you take that into consideration, Menger said, all right, so what would happen then is people are trading day in and day out, becoming aware of this phenomenon that, oh, yes, the goods, the commodities I have in my possession, not only do they have different degrees of exchange value, but they also have different degrees of saleability or marketability or liquidity. And so then the idea was, okay, and, and right now in this stage, you know, in the analysis, we're, we're not, we're assuming money doesn't exist. This is like a barter economy. We just trade commodities directly for each other or, or services directly for uh, the commodities. And so Menger's insight was to say, all right, well, if you start out with a relatively illiquid commodity and you, you know, you want to trade your horse for apples, you, you sure the best thing would be if you found somebody who had an orchard and they wanted to sell a bunch of apples and they were in the market that day looking for a horse that's ultimately you know boom you'd be done but chances are you're not going to find such a person so manga realized the next best thing would be if you can find someone who's going to sell you goods that have roughly the same market value as the apples, you think the horse is, quote, really worth if you could just find the right seller or the right buyer, depending on how you frame it, um, th that, you know, would give you something else that's more saleable or more liquid than the horse, and you're not taking a huge haircut on the underlying market value, right? So you found somebody selling oranges who's in the market for a horse that day, and the amount of oranges they would be willing to sell you is roughly equal given what you know about what oranges and apples tend to trade for in that region as what you would get if you sold it for the, you know, apples. So again, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one. -one. Like let's say oranges, let's say one orange buys two apples and that the horse would trade for a thousand apples. If you can find someone willing to trade you 500 oranges, then you're good, right? It's not that you need to get a thousand oranges. No, it's just, you get the, you get the idea, I hope. Okay. So and, you know, it doesn't have to be literally exact. Like if someone's going to give you 498 oranges, you'd probably take that. Okay. And so that's the idea. So notice what happens in a scenario like that. There's the initial degree of marketability or saleability or liquidity of the commodities based on what proportion of people in the community in a given time frame are interested in acquiring this thing that I'm trying to get rid of. And that establishes the initial layer. But then once you take into account the next level effect and you realize, oh, a lot of people like oranges. That's why oranges initially for direct consumption purposes are more marketable than horses are, right? In any given day in the market, more people are going into town hoping to walk away with oranges rather than going into town hoping to be leading a horse back home, right? So oranges originally have a, you know, I have a broader market than the horses do. But now because of that, as people engage in one level of the analysis, the market for oranges becomes even broader still. Because now people going into town with things that are less liquid than oranges, like a horse, would be willing to take the oranges because they realize that's going to bring me one step closer to my ultimate objective. And so again, it's not just the people who directly wanted to get oranges for their own consumption purposes, or, you know, you could be, it could be for production purposes too. If you're going to, you know, you're in the business of making orange juice, right? You need to get the oranges, not because you're going to sit there and eat a thousand oranges yourself, but because you're going to use to make juice. Then you go into town later and try to unload the juice. Um, but the idea is besides the people who are willing to accept oranges and trade for their direct consumption, or because they're going to directly use it to produce something else, now you've got a bunch more people who are walking into town with things that are less liquid than oranges based on the you know original raw uh, marketability factors. And they also would be willing to accept oranges under certain circumstances, right? Specifically, if the thing they're trying to get, they can't find anyone at that moment willing to sell that for their relatively illiquid thing, they might say as a fallback, okay, I would take oranges because at least that's more marketable than this horse, Okay. And so you see how now the proportion of the community that would be willing to accept oranges is bigger than it was just based on the raw fundamentals, if you will, because of that consideration of, ah, the orange is also, you know, because it's more marketable, 
it becomes even more marketable still. So that was the insight that Menger really drove home in terms of rigorous analysis. And then he just followed that process to its logical conclusion. I think you can see where this is going is that, um, as, as we've seen the goods that happen to be more marketable for direct sort of fundamental reasons in the beginning over time as more and more people are accepting it because they know, Oh, this is a stepping stone to what I ultimately want the process snowballs. And so then a few goods and services just become much, much more marketable and the process keeps reinforcing the more people who accept it in turn, that thing that makes that thing even more desirable to hold. And hence it enhances the, you know, it increases the number of people in the community that are willing to accept it as on one side of a trade. And ultimately you arrive at a situation where there's one or two commodities that are so superior and that everybody in the community virtually is willing to accept those in a trade. And then that's what a money is, right? What is money? One way of thinking about it is to say when people want to sell something they start out with, and that could include services that they perform, in order to buy goods or services from others in the community, what the money good is, is something that's like an intermediary, a way station where you sell the thing you're trying to get rid of first for the money good, and then in turn you use the money good to go buy the thing that you ultimately want. And so if everybody, if, if so it's not so much that everybody does that. It's that if there's one good um, that everybody would accept in that capacity, then that thing is the money or it's a money. If there are multiple goods that have that property being true of them. Okay. So just to introduce some terminology here, in modern Austrian economics and other economists use these terms too. Um, a good is a medium of exchange. If in a trade you accept it, not because you're going to directly consume it or even that you're directly going to use it in production, but because you're intending to trade it away again, that makes that particular thing you accepted a medium of exchange. And then if it's a, if there is a medium of exchange, that is widely or nearly universally accepted in a given community, then that medium of exchange is money. Okay, so items could be media, that's the plural, of exchange and not be money, right? If there's a certain commodity that's, you know, 20% of the people in the community will accept in a trade, even though they're just going to hold it and trade it away in the future, but the other 80% wouldn't accept that thing, it's a medium of exchange, but it's not money. Okay, so all money is a medium of exchange, but not all media of exchange are money. All right. Okay, let me make another distinction. What I just said there was the definition, again, at least in the Austrian tradition, of what money is. It's a medium of exchange that's nearly universally accepted, at least in a given community. That's what money is. That's the definition of it. If that is true, then the thing is money. If it's not true, the thing is not money. Now, side by side with that, we can talk about what are the characteristics or the qualities of a commodity that would make it likely that it would turn into that thing and satisfy that definition. And so here you talk about stuff like it's durable, it's easily divisible, um, it's homogeneous in its characteristics or its, its substance. Um, you know, I, th I think I've, I've made a few, a few, oh, it, it's got a, um, under normal market conditions, it's got a convenient amount of purchasing power relative to its size and, or its weight, right? That's another characteristic that would make something useful as a money. Okay. And so using those types of criteria, we can understand why is it that over time, if we started out in a condition of barter, that certain goods, their marketability would expand, expand, expand over time and snowball until finally, basically everybody in the community in general accepts that one thing in any given transaction is one side of it. And then up, oh, that's a money. And again, I'm, it's, it could be a money, not the money in case, you know, that's possible a community has 
more than one commodity satisfying that definition. Okay, but again, the definition says it's a medium of exchange that's universally accepted in a given community. And those other things like, oh, it's easily divisible, it's durable, um, it's homogeneous in its substance, things like that. Those are all qualities that a commodity could possess that makes it likely that it would become one of those things. Okay, and so we can go through, just to give you an idea, cut to the chase, gold and silver are excellent monies because they score well on all of those criteria that I went through, right? Gold and silver, it's you know easily divisible, whereas a horse isn't, right? So this is a good way to just walk through and just explain. Even though when I first motivated this discussion, I, I was using oranges, obviously oranges are a terrible money. Right, because among other things, they they're not durable. That's the thing that they really you know er, do poorly on in terms of those criteria I listed. Um, also, they're not homogeneous in quality. It's not like a pound of oranges is just as good as any other pound of oranges. It would matter, like you know, are they real big, thick, juicy ones, or are they real tiny ones? You know, stuff like that. Even the, the beyond the fact that whatever the quality is, if you wait a week, then the quality is going to be awful across the board. But I'm saying even if you get them at the perfect time, some oranges are better than others as far as, you know, they're the service they provide to human beings. And so that's why oranges, even though they would be more marketable than a telescope, and so somebody going into town with a telescope who's trying to get apples, if he can't find someone with a bunch of apples that wants a telescope that day, he might trade it for the oranges. Still, that's not a great improvement. He would much rather find somebody selling tobacco who wants the telescope. He would much prefer to take the tobacco because that's going to be, that's going to store much better. That's more durable than the oranges are. Um, and also it's probably more divisible too. Okay. So you, you start to see how this works. Okay. So gold and silver, like I say, do well on all of those criteria, whereas something like um, diamonds don't. Okay. So on some of the criteria, diamonds are are good. Diamonds are durable. Uh, in terms of their weight, they have a good exchange value, right? Like if you had to buy something fairly expensive, you don't need to bring 100 pounds of diamonds to get it, right? So there's, there's that element. But the problem with diamonds are they're not easily divisible. It's not that you can just, you know, cut a diamond in half and make change. Whereas with gold and silver, once they're turned into coins... You can't, but in terms of the actual, the metal itself, you know, it's not that big a deal. You can melt it down, you know, take it apart, melt it, put it back together, you know, stamp it into new coins and that's fine. Whereas with diamonds, you can't be doing that. You can't just cut them up and then put them back together and so on. That's not how diamonds work physically. Um, also too, with diamonds, it's not that a pound of diamonds is the same thing as a pound of diamonds, right? If you have one gigantic diamond versus 50 smaller diamonds that when you add them all up have the same weight as the big one, those aren't of equal value. Whereas with gold, it is like that, unless, you know, it's like a, numis a coin with numismatic value. But in general, for a given amount of purity, uh, you know, a, a gram of gold is as good as a gram of gold, whether you chop it up into little pieces or not, because again, you can just melt it and put it all together again. Whereas you can't do that with diamonds and emeralds and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, also, you know, why is it gold and silver are great, but not um, baser metals, but also not platinum, right? Back in, you know, the 1800s, it's not like there were a lot of platinum coins being traded there because there that was too scarce, right? That you, you wouldn't have had enough platinum, you know, the, the purchasing power would have been too high, okay? But and then up at the same token, no pun intended, you know, bronze coins, weren't too popular or if they were, they'd be very, you know, for low purchase things, but it's not that we don't think of it as, you know, oh yeah, the, the, a bronze standard or something, or, you know, other even baser metals. Okay. And again, it's because gold and silver really were in that sweet spot besides just the characteristics of the metals themselves, which also would have been, you know, would be true of bronze and, you know, platinum and whatever. But in terms of given the numbers and just the relative scarcities and so forth and the demands humans made of them in terms of their industrial and, and applications to jewelry and whatnot, just the, the the relative market exchange value of gold and silver made them ideal for commerce, that for relatively big purchases, you could have gold coins, but for 
smaller purchases, you could have silver coins, all right? And again, with those, you can you can take a coin and have a given, you know, certain amount of gold or silver and then put in a base or metal just to make the coin, you know, bigger and, and not like that it can, you can snap it in half or whatever. So, that, so that's fine. But in terms of, ah, yes, this disc right here contains a certain amount of gold or silver and that metal content of the precious metal is the thing that gives us economic value. And that, that, the, you know, there's that convenience factor. And again, I'm just explaining why was it that gold and silver just in our mind, oh yeah, that's natural that that's what the market's money was back when governments weren't, you know, using guns basically to shunt people off onto other things that the government's issued. That's why the market historically settled on gold and silver is the preeminent commodity monies. And it wasn't other things that prima facie you, you, you might have thought, or I should maybe a priori would be a better term there, you would have thought would also fit the bill. Like you might have thought emeralds or rubies or diamonds or platinum also could have been the money. But now I've, you know, I've walked you through why this. But again, I just want you to be careful here. It's not that, oh, what makes something a money in terms of economic theory is that it's divisible, durable. Da, da, no, those are all characteristics that in practice will help us understand why a particular commodity would become a medium of exchange that's universally accepted. But it's being a medium of exchange that's universally or nearly universally accepted that makes something the money, right? Those other characteristics are just things that tend to be associated with a commodity that achieves that status. Okay, so that's Menger's explanation. And again, just to anticipate in a little bit here, I will a deal with the critique of that story I just told that's coming from anthropologists and MMT types. But before we do that, let me now explain what was the contribution of Ludwig von Mises to monetary theory. So here, you know, and it's, I think this is an underappreciated element of what Mises did, just his role as a theoretical economist. And uh, that's partly why I want to just covered this topic in this episode of the Human Action Podcast because, you know, this is something that I think is perhaps not fully appreciated among, I mean, the, the people with PhDs in academia who are Austrian economists know this, but I'm just saying the rank and file know stuff like, oh yeah, Mises wrote a scathing critique of socialism and he explained the importance of economic calculation and, you know, other things that he, he may have done, but this element here that he did with uh, monetary theory, I think is quite interesting. So, Remember, as I, we've talked about on this very podcast not too long ago, in the early 1870s, there was what was called the Marginal Revolution, and that displaced the old uh, cost-slash-labor theory of value explanation of market prices. It replaced it with a marginal subjectivist approach. All right, and, and I... In the show notes page here, I'll, I'll link to that if you missed that episode. It was it was fairly recent. Okay, and so the, that was the new method, let's say by, you know, the 1880s. This was now the new approach that more and more economists were embracing. Bombavark you know, wrote lengthy expositions on this is how you use this new framework that Carl Menger gave us and William Stanley Jevons did and Leon Wall Ross did in their own different ways for explaining the exchange ratio and the inequilibrium of commodities. But really what Menger and Jevons and Wall Ross spelled out really was just, if you looked at final consumer goods and how do we explain as economists the determination of the equilibrium exchange ratios of those goods where the reason people value them is because they're going to directly consume them. That's ultimate, you know, that they had that explanation down pat and they could explain that very well. But it still seemed like there was a, a difficulty in, okay, well, how do we explain though the market value of the money commodity in its role as a commodity? Or you could say qua, Q-U-A, right? This, this commodity qua money how do we as economists explain its value or its purchasing power? And that seemed 
for many economists, it seemed like the new marginal utility approach didn't didn't work in that context. And he, and here was the issue, as they said, all right. I understand if we want to say why is it that one orange trades for two apples, and I can understand. Ah, yes, I've read Menger and Walras and Jevons, and they're saying, oh, because people have preferences, and what's really you know the contribution is they have preferences on the margin, right? So it's not just to say, do I like apples more than oranges? It's given that right now I have 10 oranges and three apples on the margin, you know, do I, if I want to give up that 10th orange to get my fourth apple, is that, you know, would that increase my utility? You know, that's the way you, you do things. You, you evaluate it on the margin and that unlocked the solution to some of the problems that were tripping up the classical economists when they were trying to explain the origin of market prices or the determination of market prices, okay? And so it makes sense just when you're doing that explanation, just to assert, oh yeah, let's just assume people have preference scales or rankings of the different uh, units that they might have of various types of commodities. And so we could say, yeah, for some people, that 10th orange is not as valuable to them as the fourth apple, but for some people it is. And, the, and once you have those different preference scales or rankings that are, you know, an ordinal approach framework, I can explain, ah, yes. Yeah. So given that the people in the community start out with these preferences and the original distribution of oranges and apples in various people's possession, given a, a known market exchange ratio of apples for oranges, everybody figures out how many oranges or apples they want to sell or buy or vice versa, or maybe they don't want to do anything at that price and given their initial stock. And then equilibrium occurs when, given what the price exchange ratio is, the, the barter exchange ratio, the amount of apples being sold for oranges equals the amount of oranges being sold for apples, and or you get what I'm saying, the reciprocal, and that's fine. Everybody's happy. And then everyone, you know, some trades occur, and then everybody walks away from the marketplace better off than they entered it. And given that exchange ratio, nobody can rearrange their holdings in a way that increases their utility, right? Okay, so you can tell that story. You know, Menger does it in words and with some charts or diagrams. Jevons, similar type of thing, while Ross did it more mathematically. But, you know, same basic concepts. Okay, great. But there, again, the, the building block for that story is that people have preferences for apples and oranges or, you know, different units of them. And as economists, we don't really need to dwell on, well, why is that? I just say, well, they do, and all well, because they eat them, or you know, they're going to use the, the oranges to make orange juice. You're going to use the apples to make apple pie, or whatever. But that's kind of the the idea. We don't. We just need to assert that they have valuations on the margin for different units in their stockpile of the various commodities, and then you're off to the races. But when it comes to money, especially if we're focusing on a commodity's role, qua money, there it's it's not as obvious, right? Because, you know, why is it that I would trade my 10th apple in order to get my first silver coin? Well, it's not because, well, you're going to eat the coin or it's not even that you're going to use the coin to go build something. It's because, oh, I'm going to trade the coin away in the future for something else. And so really you're kind of doing a two-step looking into the future problem where, Really, what I'm doing implicitly is trading my 10th apple for whatever it is that that silver coin is going to allow me to purchase, right? And so it seems like the valuation we assign to that silver coin is derived from its purchasing power, right? That's really why it's valuable to us, not because we're going to directly consume it and not even because it's physically productive, and that we you know value the things that it's going to produce, but because we're going to trade it away at some point in the future. So our preference for and valuation on the margin of silver coins, when silver is you know one of the monies in our community, is itself based on its purchasing power. So the economists, you know, in between when Menger you know wrote about the origin of money, but also more specifically, you know, introducing the marginal utility approach. And before Mises wrote, you know, what I think we would call his doctoral dissertation, in that interim period, economists were applying this new marginal utility theory in different contexts, but it 
a lot of them hesitated to apply it to explain the value of money because they thought you would just be arguing in a circle. So let me just spell out what the apparent uh, circularity was of the argument. You're saying when we try to understand um, why would somebody give up a certain amount of apples to get one silver coin, really what we're talking about there is we're explaining the purchasing power of the silver coin. Right to say somebody would be willing to give up ten apples to get one silver coin, we're explaining why the silver coin can fetch ten apples in the marketplace. But now, if in the very act of us explaining why that should occur, we have to say because the guy giving up the ten apples knows the silver coin has a certain amount of purchasing power, for him to even know that, he's got to know what will people in this community be willing to give up in terms of real goods and services for this silver coin? And so it seems like what you're doing is you're explaining the purchasing power of the silver coin by reference to the fact that the silver coin has purchasing power. Or in other words, you're saying, oh, the reason you can buy things with this silver coin is because you can buy things with this silver coin. So do you see how if I say it like that, it looks like you're just arguing in a big circle? And so again, I want to be clear the reason it seemed like this new approach worked with goods like oranges and apples and you know horses and stagecoaches and gunpowder was that there, as an economist, you know you could ultimately defer to other things external to the economic sciences as to why somebody might value oranges and apples and gunpowder. Whereas with money, qua money, the reason you're valuing it is precisely because of its purchasing power. So it seemed again, like a circular argument to say the reason we're going to explain its purchasing power by reference to its purchasing power. Whereas again, with those other things that aren't money, you are ultimately saying, Oh, we're going to explain the market value or the purchasing power, if you will, right? Like if I want to sell oranges in the marketplace, what other types of goods and services can I get for my oranges, you know, working through money there, you know, you're, the the explanation boils down to, oh, yeah, people have preferences for apples and oranges because they're going to eat them or whatever. And so you're not explaining the purchasing power of oranges by reference to the purchasing power of oranges. You're explaining it by something more primitive or fundamental. So it's, you're, you're starting out with those raw primitives and then building up the derived explanation of the purchasing power or the exchange ratios of those things. But again, with the money, it seemed like you were just arguing in a big circle. Or to put it a different way, if I could tell a story and say, yep, this silver coin trades for 10 oranges, and you say, why? And you say, oh, because the silver coin trades for 10 oranges. Well, then why couldn't I also just plug in 100 and say, oh, the reason somebody would give up 100 oranges to get a silver coin is because he knows in this community, this silver coin fetches the market equivalent of 100 oranges, right? So if that's the explanation, I can just plug in any number I want and just make the purchasing power of the money as high or as low as I want. And the story is internally consistent, but it seems like you're not really pinning down, you know, you're not really nailing down, well, but why is the purchasing power of the silver coin 100 oranges and not 20? Okay, so that that's the idea. Whereas you can, again, with, you know, explain why oranges trade one orange for two apples. You know, you, you there's a reason for those particular numbers based on the assumptions you make about the people's preferences and the given stockpiles they start out with and so forth. Okay. So that was the that was the roadblock. And so what economists had done is they had built up a model of the economy, assuming the trades were all barter exchanges of of you know final consumer goods directly trading for each other, and then you know, involving, you know, some of the elaboration of um Visa, among others, they even took it further and explained the the valuation of the factors of production. You know, saying, okay, the reason you would value, uh, you know, some some kerosene or whatever is because it's going to be useful in this production process, or the reason you would value these seeds is because you're going to plant them and then that's going to create apples down the road, and then we can explain the exchange value of apples because they're consumption goods, and da da da, and so you can you know derive the the valuation of the apple seeds, so forth. So they would build up this whole elaborate explanation of market prices in equilibrium based on you know consumer preferences and initial stockpiles of the various goods and everything in terms of 
direct barter exchanges. Like, yeah, we can explain why is it that one orange trades for two apples, but then to explain, okay, but in the real world, people don't sell apples directly for oranges. They sell the oranges for money with which they buy the apples and they sell the apples for money with which they buy the oranges. So what is it that establishes that exchange rate of the goods against the money unit or the money commodity there? The economist used a whole different framework. It was a very holistic macro analysis where they kind of just looked at the price level and the money stock and the velocity of circulation and stuff like that. You know, whereas with apples and oranges, they weren't looking and saying, well, how many apples are there in the society as a whole? And what's the rate of turnover of apples per period? It, like, they didn't talk like that. It was just, no, you look at, at some given individual, what his individual subjective preferences are. How many apples is he starting out with? You know, how many oranges is he starting out with? And then in the market, you know, that's how you would talk. But they weren't doing that with money. They thought, no, if you try that with money, you just walk in a big circle. So let's not do that. What we can explain with this marginal utility approach that Menger et al. gave us are the direct commodity exchange ratios. And then the money prices, we just lay on top of that. And, you know, we and we scale it up or down based on, well, how, what's the money stock and what's the velocity of circulate, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. So Mises blew that up. Mises showed, no, 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 we don't need a separate theoretical framework to first explain exchange ratios in terms of direct barter rates. And then as a completely separate mechanism, theoretical approach, we overlay you know, the, the absolute value of money prices, right? So it was like they had the, the marginal utility approach to explain relative prices, but then to explain absolute money prices, you know, one orange trades for two apples, but does one orange trade for one shilling and an apple trades for a half a shilling? Or is it one orange trades for 10 shillings and one apple trades for five shillings, right? Like those are all consistent, and so Mises was saying, we don't have to do that. I'm going to use one unified value theory to explain the valuation both subjectively and objectively in terms of market exchange rates for every commodity, including the money commodity. And so here's how he got through that apparent logical problem or fallacy is he said, yeah, it is true. On the margin, you know, at the outset of our explanation, we say, why is it that uh, whatever I you know, 10 oranges trades for one silver coin. It's because, yep, that person, you know, see how many silver coins he started with. Let's say he's starting out with 10 silver coins and 10 apples. If he sells his 10 apples to get another silver coin, that's because he values on the margin that 11th silver coin more than he valued his first 10 units, you know, his first, second, third, fourth, up to the 10th units of apples. And that's why he did it. And from the other person's point of view, it's vice versa. Whatever silver coin that is to that person, he valued that less on the margin than he did for, you know, the next 10 units of apples that he's receiving. That You know, that's fine. And if you ask, well, why is it that the person, you know, valued that 11th silver coin at that amount? Mises says, yep, you're right. It does involve the purchasing power. You need to know that. Right? If you were in a coma and you woke up, and you didn't even know what year it was, you know, how long you were out. And someone said, hey, uh, I hear you're good at, uh, you know, giving haircuts. Can you give me a haircut for $100,000? At first, you might be like, oh, yeah, totally. But then what if you catch yourself? And you're like, well, wait a minute. I don't know how long I've been out. I need to first go see what's the purchasing power of the dollar at this point. Because, you know, for all I know, $100,000 buys me an egg. And normally, you know, I wouldn't give a haircut for one egg. Right. And so that, so there again, you need to know what does a hundred thousand dollars buy me in the marketplace before you decide, am I going to give up my time, you know, to perform the haircut in order to get that money? You need to know what's its purchasing power. So Mises was on board with that, but he said, it's not a circular problem, right? So how do we know what the purchasing power of the money is in our community? He said, well, strictly speaking, what we're doing is we're explaining the purchasing power right now because we're explaining what, you know, what, how many goods and services would somebody be willing to give up right now to get the money? 
So once we are done with this explanation, what we will have explained is its immediate purchasing power. So the people making those exchanges who are, again, selling real goods and services to get money, what's guiding them they're looking ahead and they're really what they're doing is they're forecasting and saying, what do I expect the purchasing power of this money to be in the near future? Because that's really guiding their decisions. And then when you say, well, well how would they know that? They're largely relying on their experience of money's purchasing power in the immediate past, right? So by looking around at what money's buying right now, Really, you know, the moment you make a decision, right? So you're saying, should I cut this guy's hair for $100,000? You first look around, you're seeing exchanges taking place right now. If you then cut his hair, technically, that will be a little bit in the future. So those prices that you observed were in the past at that point. And ultimately, you're doing it because when the, you're done with the giving the haircut and get the money, if you go to spend it now, that's actually in the near future. Okay, so Mises was splitting up the time element. The way I've summarized this in my writings on this stuff, just to keep it distinct. So Mises didn't say it like this, but I think this is consistent with what he said, is that Mises explained money's purchasing power today first by reference to its expected purchasing power tomorrow. And then how did we you know, how do people come up with that explanation or or that expectation, I should say, by looking at what the money's purchasing power was yesterday, okay? So notice there, we've, we've dissolved the alleged circularity problem. We're not saying money's purchasing power today, we explain by reference to money's purchasing power today. That would indeed be a circular argument. That's not what Mises was saying. So, no, no, we explain money's purchasing power today by reference to its expected purchasing power tomorrow. And then if you ask, well, how do people know what that is? Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, but a chief ingredient is their observations or their experience of its purchasing power yesterday. So ultimately, you're explaining money's purchasing power today by reference to its purchasing power yesterday, right? So that's not a circular argument. And just to avoid confusion, if you know that you know the Fed's going to do something crazy, and they're going to dump boatloads of money. You can take that into account. It's not that you just blindly think, oh yeah, whatever money bought at the store yesterday is going to be true tomorrow. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying to get some frame of reference, a starting point by which you can then add on your things about, oh, and this is what I think the banks are doing and the Fed's doing or whatever. You, you know, you got to have some some starting point for those further, you know, uh, elaborations or, or sophisticated things that you add on top of it. Okay? Okay, so now you might say, all right, so Mises got around the circularity problem, but don't we still have a problem here? If you're basically explaining money's purchasing power today by reference to its purchasing power yesterday, now it seems like we still have a problem of an infinite regress. Because if we go to yesterday and say, all right, at that point, we as economists, how do we explain money's purchasing power? You say, oh, by reference to its purchasing power the day before, right? And so don't we just have to keep going backwards in time forever and so we still have not given a ground zero. This is why the silver coin buys 10 oranges and not 100 oranges, right? Because we're saying, oh, the reason this, the silver coin today buys 10 oranges is because yesterday it bought nine oranges and then there was, you know, an increase in the orange crop or whatever. And that's, but, but still, well, no, but, but why yesterday did it buy nine, right? Well, how come it didn't buy 90 or how come it didn't buy one? And, you know, and, and so that why wasn't that the starting point yesterday? But then with the little tweak in the orange crop, we would adjust it. But how come the bra starting block wasn't 10 times higher or one tenth as high yesterday? And then if we say, oh, because you look at the day before. So doesn't it seem like we still have that same basic problem of how do we get a baseline if you're ultimately explaining the purchasing power by the purchasing power, right? But Mises had an answer. He said, no, 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 it's not an infinite regress. So he said, yes, logically speaking, it is true. My story so far does involve the fact that if I'm basically, if one of the major ingredients to explain money's purchasing power today is people's observations or experience of what its purchasing power was yesterday, it is true that if you raise the question, but yesterday, how did people, you know, what determined the price of the purchasing power of money yesterday? And you say, purchasing power of money the day before. 
and you keep working backwards, it's not an infinite regress. And why? He says, because as Carl Menger showed us, there was a point at which money didn't exist. And all of the commodities that people traded were accepted purely for their role, either directly in consumption or in production. And so the the act, you know, the specific term would be it was a it was a regime of direct exchange. Okay, so barter is a little bit of a fuzzy term. The more uh, crisp terms in terms of economic theory is direct exchange versus indirect exchange. Okay, indirect exchange means there's a medium of exchange involved. Okay, so what Mises is saying is logically speaking, again, not that we found some guy's diary or some history book that spelled this all out, but he's just saying logically speaking to try to use that marginal utility approach to explain the value of the commodity that is the money. It's not that we're involved in a circular argument and it's not that we're involved in an infinite regress. Yes, we are involved in a regress, but it's finite. We have to trace step-by-step step back, at least conceptually, until the point at which the commodity that in our day is the money, the further back in time we go, at some point we reach the step in our argument at which it was not valued because of its role as a medium of exchange. It was just valued directly because someone was going to consume it or use it in you know a production process. Okay, so that was how Mises showed we can use the same marginal utility subjective value theory to explain the valuation and pricing of every good, including the good that happens to be the money. Okay? I'm not going to dwell on it right now, but incidentally, what I just walked through there, that's very closely related to what's called the regression theorem. And so Mises also in several places says things along the lines of, you know, once you see what I just did there in that explanation, you realize any good that today serves as money must have at some point in the past um, not been a medium of exchange, that there must have been some prior history of this thing being directly valued for its own sake. And, 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 and so notice... The story that Menger told, you know, explains the origin of money without reference to a wise king and nobody's trying to create money, it just kind of happens. And then Mises' story again um, is showing that things emerge and they become media of exchange and so on, but it solves all the problems that we talked about at the start of this episode. We don't need the wise king, anymore, but also the issue of the exchange ratios, right? This story explains that. Right, that oh, the thing that emerges is the money. The the way the reason people knew at the outset that um the one orange whatever the money ended up being, like why one silver coin trades for 10 oranges and not for 200 or not for one, is because before people accepted the silver coin as money or even as a medium of exchange, they valued the silver because it was useful, you know, in industrial applications or for jewelry or what have you. Okay, and so that's why there was some basis. They knew what the exchange rate was between silver and the other goods. And so then once as silver became the money, you know, they, they had some framework there. Okay. By the way, don't misunderstand me. Mises was not saying, and this is what some critics or, or even fans actually early on thought, some theorists thought that Mises was saying the value of commodities that are also money is to be explained solely by reference to their value in industrial applications or, you know, for jewelry or whatever. That was not what Mises was saying. No, he was, he was agreeing like gold had a higher market value in his day because it served as the money relative to a scenario where it had only been valued for industrial purposes or for jewelry. He was saying that, no, the, the equilibrium purchasing price per, you know, ounce of silver or ounce of gold was higher because of its monetary services. Okay. So th those are, those are different things like you, but, but he was just saying, logically speaking to explain the process by which you use subjective value theory to explain the purchasing power of money of, of gold ultimately involves, if you want to carry it through to logical consistency, you go backwards in time, at least mentally, well, you're not going to take a time machine, and 
you get to the point at which the gold was not money. Okay, but that's not the same thing as saying right now when gold is the money to explain its current market value, we just look at, oh, it's its ability to you know be in fillings in people's teeth and stuff like that. No, that's not what he was saying. Okay, the fact that people hold stockpiles of gold in their vaults around the world for, quote, monetary reasons, that is a large driver of its market price. You know, why you can tr trade an ounce of gold for so many apples and so many oranges. The fact that people around the world are stockpiling gold is a hedge against inflation, like in our terminology. That's a, a big component of the story. But we're saying the reason gold got into that situation in the first place is because, you know, in the distant past, there was a period when humans valued gold just for its direct purpose. Sometimes people might refer to that as intrinsic value. I mean, you can take that or leave it. It's it's a little bit dubious, you know, given subjective value theory, because there's no such thing as intrinsic value. Everything's in the mind of the beholder. But th that's what people are trying to get at when they use that term intrinsic value. Okay. Having said all that, real quick side note, Mises regression theorem and this sort of analysis I just walked you through is why, especially when Bitcoin first came out, there were many Austrians who thought Bitcoin can never be a real money because it doesn't have this beginning period of its origin story where people were using Bitcoins to make sandwiches or even to build cars or something or to you know, be used to refine aluminum or something, right? If Bitcoin just never is any is good for anything except, quote, being a potential money, well, then it can't work. That was the argument. Here, I'm not going to get into that, but I, I hope you can see why people thought that, right? Because it's that certainly seems... And so I deal with that in my book that the Mises Institute puts out called Understanding Money Mechanics. You can just Google my name in that and you'll get the, you know, the free PDFs available where you can get the physical copy. But I go into that, just try to walk through how should we think about that issue. But I just raise it here. Okay, last thing I want to do somewhat quickly now in this current episode is dealing with David Graeber. So here I'm relying on, I wrote an article for the American Conservative. They, they came up with this clever title. They called it Origin of the Specie, right? So kind of a plan, Origin of the Species, because specie is a word that um, for gold and silver, when that was like there was paper currency that was were claims on, like banknotes that were claims on gold and silver coin, the specie meant, you know, the hard real money that would redeem it, right? So the origin of the specie, if we're talking about where did money come from, that was a clever title they gave it to it. And specifically what I was doing, this was a book review of David Graeber's book, which was titled Debt, the First 5,000 Years. So in this review, or sorry, in this book, among other things, Graeber launches a full-scale assault on the standard economist story of the origin of money. So let me just read um, a few passages from Graeber, and I'll just give you the quick response that I gave in this article. So this is Graeber. So he first summarized the standard story, like, you know, that Adam Smith or Menger, um, I think J.B. Say might have, he quoted some French economists, and now the name's escaping me. I forget which one he quoted you know, given that standard origin of money story, and then this is Graeber now critiquing it. The problem is there's no evidence that it ever happened and an enormous amount of evidence suggesting that it did not. For centuries now, explorers have been trying to find this fabled land of barter, none with success. Adam Smith set his story in Aboriginal North America, but Lewis Henry Morgan's description of the six nations of the Iroquois made clear that the main economic institutions among the Iroquois nations were longhouses where most goods were stockpiled and then allocated by women's councils, and no one ever traded arrowheads for slabs of meat. To this day, no one has been able to locate a part of the world where the ordinary mode of economic transactions between neighbors takes the form of, I'll give you 20 chickens for that cow. Okay, so... And again, the, the reason I'm focusing on this is because this has really gained traction. It was even in that um, the MMT documentary called Finding the Money that here on this podcast, I walked through methodically and gave a pretty systematic critique. But I don't think in my critique there, I got into it because I just ran out of time. But this was something they got into in that documentary where they made fun of this origin story that the economists give. And they were saying, yeah, the economists want you to think that money emerge spontaneously because they don't want there to be any role for the state, 
right? This, this way, these laissez-faire economists can just say, we don't need the government, but really government created the money, right? That's, that's what their storyline is. And they think that we're being ideological by trying to say, no, 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 it didn't involve the wise king. So here, Graeber's saying, hey, you know, don't trust these armchair economists who can't be bothered to crack a history book or anthropology, anthropology text. They have no idea. They're just making this stuff up. Um, so yes and no. So yes, Adam Smith and Carl Menger, they were not claiming that, oh yes, we looked at these ancient archaeological digs and we've discovered this is where, no, they were doing a conceptual, logical backfilling, if you will, to explain theoretically how you could start from a condition of barter exchange and then explain the origin of money. But what Graeber's trying to do here by saying, hey, I'm looking around. I don't see any evidence of a barter economy anywhere. That's goofy, right? Because part of what the economists are doing is they're showing, you know, what, the, what are the limitations of direct exchange? Why barter alone leaves a lot of potential value on the table, if you will. There's lots of gains from trade that if you can't just do it in one-off trades where there's like, oh yeah, if this guy were to trade his stuff to this guy over here, then that guy were to trade it to this guy over here and this guy, you know, if you do sort of a multilateral exchange of goods, everybody can walk away when the, when, when the, the chain is done better off, but in any one by one thing, one party's worse off, right? Whereas with money, you get around that, right? The one, so, you know, like the, the butcher wants eggs, but the chicken farmer doesn't want uh, beef, you know, doesn't want hamburger, right? And so then there's a problem. But then if the cobbler wants um, beef and doesn't want eggs or, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little mixed up as I'm doing it, but you get the idea. If there's three people and they each, you know, want something that one of the other people has and they're willing to give up, but it doesn't match up for any two at a time with one-off trades that can't work. But if they can all kind of like rotate what they have around the circle clockwise or whatever, then they can all be better off that would work and money allows that to happen because then one person just trades his thing for money. He buys what he wants for money. That person uses his money to buy what he wants. And then it's like the money just all kind of makes a, a circuit around. Everyone ends up with the same amount of money they had at the beginning, but now they gave up what they wanted to get rid of and they got something else that they valued more highly. And that's true for everybody in the circle, right? So money allows for multi-party transactions that one-off barter exchanges would not allow unless people were like looking ahead and, you know, doing real sophisticated things. Whereas money just means, nope, all I have to know is I know what the money can buy. Do I want to give up my thing for the money? Yes or no. And that's all you got to do. So, so the existence of money greatly simplifies the, the computations you got to go through mentally to figure out, you know, how am I going to do this? And so it facilitates large scale, large scale rearrangement of goods among many people. Right. So, Graeber is saying, you know, I'm looking around. I don't see any barter economies anywhere, but that's part of the point, right? That the economist is saying barter is incredibly inefficient. There's lots of potential gains from trade for more complex movements of goods among hands that money facilitates. And so it would actually be more of a critique for the economist's story about the origin of money if missionaries did stumble upon some primitive tribe somewhere and say, look, They've been using barter for hundreds of years and they don't know what a medium of exchange is. Like it didn't occur to them. That would be more of a problem for the story than, oh gee, we, we've never stumbled upon a people that just use barter transactions, okay? So that's a little bit goofy. Um, now what he, d let me just mention before I forget, we do have a case study of, of Menger's story in action, right? It was, it was by this guy, Radford, and it was called the economics of a POW camp. And so he was, I think he was English. He was a trained economist. He was in World War II. I think he was like shot down. But anyway, he ended up in a German POW camp. And so here he is a trained economist in this camp. And then afterwards he, you know, wrote up what happened. And I'm, I'm simplifying here and some of my details might be hazy, but this is generally the spirit of it for sure. That, um, you know, the Red Cross would come and give rations so the prisoners, you know, the Germans let that come in and you get your kit and you've got like two cigarettes and some hand and, you know, whatever else you got in there. And, um, I mean, you know, maybe a, a, some bread or something or a biscuit. And so over time, what ended up happening 
is the cigarettes became the money and such that like they would have chalkboards up and just show prices. And I, I think what it ended up being is he was talking about like, it was actually what they meant when they said a cigarette was the amount of tobacco that would be in one standard cigarette. That's really what the monetary unit was. And so when they quoted and said, oh yeah, for today's prices, we've got uh, cans of ham that, uh, you know, are going for three cigarettes. What that meant was, you know, so you couldn't just take a cigarette and like shake out some of the tobacco and try to pass that off. They would say, no, 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 that's not a, that's not what we mean. It's not a full bodied cigarette. Right. So that was the idea. Okay. And of course there, it, even people who didn't smoke would still trade what they had to get cigarettes because they knew, oh, it's going to be quite easy for me to trade away the cigarettes to get whatever it is that I want today. And then, you know, from my other prisoners here in the marketplace. Okay. So there it, it clearly, it wasn't that the German guards said, everybody, you're going to now use these cigarettes as money. No, it just happened spontaneously. Right. And again, why? Because the cigarettes, you know, served those, the purpose they were durable, easily divisible, right? If you, if you had to buy something that was only a half cigarette, you could just dump out half of the tobacco and, you know, you could re-roll stuff later if you wanted to, if somebody wanted to smoke it. Right. So that was, that was the idea. But, you know, wh where did it come from? How did they know what the exchange ratios were? Well, because before cigarettes became the money, people just doing one-off trades, you know, and say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, hey, man, I really need to smoke. Okay. Well, you know, give me your biscuit. Well, no. Okay. Give me half of your biscuit for, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, or sorry, give me two biscuits if you're, if you're holding out with your cigarette. Right. And so that's how the exchange ratios would get off the ground. And then once people realize, well, no, in general, you're not going to have any trouble getting rid of cigarettes in a POW camp. There's a plenty of smokers. Then people just started to realize, oh, it's real. And, you know, and the cigarettes are easy to carry around. They're convenient and so forth. Right. Okay. So this idea that we have no record of this happening ever. No, we have a case study of the Mangarian story playing out in real time from a trained economist who wrote it up after the fact. Uh, but, and again, the fact that we don't have any re evidence of some civilization that just relied on barter, well, of course we wouldn't. That's part of the point. You actually wouldn't have an advanced economy, you know, with written records and so forth if they didn't have money. Like money is a very, you know, easy thing that would emerge relatively early among people. Okay. Um, okay. Now, in fairness, Graeber does make a point that I think is a, is a valid one. So let me just read that quickly. He says, there's, there's just one major conceptual problem here. One the attentive reader might have noticed. Henry owes his neighbor Joshua. Oh, oops. Okay. Sorry. Hang on. I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. First, what Graeber did was he said, um, rather than this model that the economists use of a community that just relies on barter transactions, really what they would do, it was more of a customary um, credit transaction. So it wasn't just that your neighbors would say, hey, here's my cow and I want your berries and let's trade. It was more like if you were hungry and needed your neighbor's berries, you'd say, hey, can I have some of your berries right now? And I'm good for it. You know, down the road, when I have relative plenty and you need something, then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pay you back. Can you do me a solid? And that was more like that is what these communities would do rather than these sort of one-off capitalistic transactions, the way these idiot economists think, right? That, that, you know, uh, other societies are organized on principles involving community relations more. And it's more of a, you know, Hey, can you do me a favor today? And down the road, I'll pay you back kind of thing. Okay. So I, I think Graeber is right that normally the way we teach this stuff uh, didn't take that into account. It was always just a static one-off, you know, people meeting in the local town bazaar and then they walk away and they never see each other again. Whereas he's saying, no, no, if you got people living in proximity for their whole lives, you know, intertemporal trades would, you know, that's something that might be more foundational than we normally give credit to in the economist story. Fair enough. But, but now we get into an issue here. So Graber's, you know, talking about this is how I think money emerged, you know, not this Adam Smith, Carl Menger story, but instead the community, they're all living together and people with relative abundance will give to those in need. 
then, hey, I scratch your back today. Down the road, you scratch mine. And now Graber says, there's just one major conceptual problem here. One the attentive reader might have noticed. Henry owes his neighbor Joshua one. But one what? How do you quantify a favor? On what basis do you say that this many potatoes or this big a pig seems more or less equivalent to a pair of shoes? Because even if these things remain rough and ready approximations, there must be some way to establish that X is roughly equivalent to Y or slightly worse or slightly better. Doesn't this imply that something like money, at least in the sense of a unit of account, already has to exist? Okay, so to his credit, Graeber is acknowledging the theoretical problem with his you know, his offered explanation, you know, instead of the standard Carl Menger story, what Graeber's trying to say instead, and he's admitting, yeah, just if I, if I start from the fact that the community might be trading favors, if you will, over time, and, and that's where I'm thinking money comes from, not this economist story of one-off barter transactions, Graeber's admitting it, it, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because to say that, oh yeah, you know, the, the guy with all the pigs were really hungry. Hey, can we have some bacon today? And we'll, we, you know, we're, we're good for it. We'll pay you back. But it's not that we're going to pay you back bacon, right? Because if he's the guy with the pigs and you're the people with the berries, you it's not that you're going to, hey, can you give me some bacon today? And then down the road, we'll give you bacon when you need it. That's never going to happen, right? Or it's going to be something like, hey, can you give me some bacon today? And, you know, next harvest or whatever, when you need extra people to help you pick your crops, my sons will go work for you, and that's how we'll repay you this favor you're doing for us today by giving us the bacon when we're, you know, really hungry. And so Graber's try, saying to try to explain the origin of money through that process, h- how is it that you have all these disparate goods? Like, don't you need to have some way of saying how many hours of my son's labor harvesting your crops is equivalent to the pound of bacon you gave us when we were hungry that one time? right? That you need to know what those exchange ratios are. Otherwise, you know, what does it mean to say, oh yeah, that you gave us some bacon, so now we owe you, but owe you what? Even if we say we owe you some labor hours next harvest, how many, right? That in and of itself, just to say we owe you. And so Graber, you know, raises the question, doesn't this imply that something like money must already exist? And so he thinks the answer is no, right? Because he's trying to explain the origin of money, he doesn't want to be arguing in a circle. I don't have it quoted for you here. Like, I think what happened is he just spent some paragraphs meandering around and didn't answer his problem. So I at least applaud his intellectual honesty. In that MMT documentary, I think it was Randall Ray did a similar thing. Like, he kind of raised the issue and said, now, admittedly, there's a bit of a conceptual hurdle here to go from this, you know, favor-based, hey, I owe you one, explain, you know, story to, you know, that's where money comes from historically to say, well, well, how does that happen exactly? But I don't think they ever, you know, he's certainly an MMT documentary. They don't solve it. And I don't think Graeber solved it in his book either. And to me, it's because there is no solution, right? That no, the, the only way you could do that is if the community, you know, at least had some standard by which they could say, oh yeah, it's kind of understood that a pound of bacon trades for voluntarily three hours of picking crops or something, right? And then it would make sense to say, oh yeah, you gave us that bacon that one time. We owe you three hours of labor. Even there, there's the time element involved too, right? That it, it makes a difference. Do I have to give you the three hours tomorrow or just six months from now? You know, that could matter. But in any event, you see what I'm saying. They're not really getting around the issue that we, we raised back when I was explaining Menger's objection to the state origin theory of money to say, even if you assumed that the wise king holds up shells or something or rocks and says, this is the money. Well, how do you know how many horses does a rock trade for? How many apples? So you kind of need to know, you know, that those exchange ratios are already. Okay. So if, if, if Graber is trying to, to not even start with those original barter exchange ratios and explain money that way, well, then it seems like you're, you're dead in the water. And I don't think he, he raises the problem, but my mind doesn't solve it. Okay. Now, last thing I'll say here, and I'll wrap up. Graeber goes on to say, talking about um, the economy of the ancient Sumerians. The basic monetary unit was the silver shekel. One shekel's weight in silver was established as the equivalent of one gur, G-U-R, or bushel of barley. 
A shekel was subdivided into 60 minas corresponding to one portion of barley, and temple workers received two rations of barley every day. It's easy to see that money, in this sense, is in no way the product of commercial transactions. It was actually created by bureaucrats in order to keep track of resources and move things back and forth between departments. Okay, so my observation here was, doesn't that seem like a, an extraordinary coincidence? He's saying the reason that the silver shekel was money was because the temple bureaucrats just picked it, right? It wasn't because of, you know, that wasn't the emergent phenomenon, the spontaneous order that was spit out of this, you know, process that Menger talked about where, you know, I, where we can explain why silver would pop out of that. He's saying, no, the temple bureaucrats picked it. And it was just kind of a way of, you know, bookkeeping. So why would they pick silver? Doesn't that seem like a huge coincidence? They could have picked anything. They could have even just, you know, picked Satoshis and just had this abstract unit that they kept track of by writing on the walls or something. Why was it that they picked something physical and picked silver? So I would say, you know, clearly it's not that we have their diaries from the time and they say, yes, there was no such thing as money in the temple bureaucrats. Say, no, what we have are records knowing that, oh yeah, the bureaucrats paid these people in silver shekels. And then Graeber is ex post explaining that by saying, oh, the bureaucrats must have invented that and picked that. And we don't have records of silver trading, you know, emerging from this barter process the way Carl Menger talked about. So it must be the, and I would say, no, I think it's much more likely that silver did emerge through the process that Menger talked about. We don't have records of that because it would have been a primitive society before money existed. And once silver was the money in that region, it's not surprising the temple bureaucrats co-opted that and used it themselves when they paid workers. That makes way more sense than that. No, they just picked something by fiat and they happened to pick the thing that later on clearly was the market's choice for the reasons that, you know, Menger talked about, right? Um, also, just to give support to what I said there, Graeber writes, in the marketplaces that cropped up in Mesopotamian cities, prices were also calculated in silver, and the prices of commodities that weren't entirely controlled by the temples and palaces would tend to fluctuate according to supply and demand, right? So <laughs> he's admitting, oh yeah, in the external world, and he also talks about um, when people in that region would trade with you know, merchants from far off lands, they would use silver too with those people, right? So again, his story is, Oh, yeah, the reason in our marketplaces and one-off trades, people use silver. And when we deal with foreigners that we're never going to see again, we use silver. And the temple bureaucrats use silver. The reason is because the temple bureaucrats just unilaterally picked it and then everybody else just followed suit, not through the spontaneous, you know, story that Menger talked about. Okay, so to me, that's that's clear what, what's really going on there. And despite what I think is the obvious shoddiness of his own story, um, Graber then, after he goes through this demonstration, then says, referring to the Mangarian story, rarely has an historical theory been so absolutely and systematically refuted, right? And so then Graber and all his fans, the MT people, are all running victory laps, thinking they just blew up Menger when, again, I would say in their own approach, A, they can't explain the different exchange ratios. They just, you know, they, they at least some of them are honest enough to admit, yeah, there is this issue of just using credit in a sense, barter transactions through time, how do we explain how you amalgamate them into one common unit without relying on just, you know, all the different exchange ratios? Um, and then also the one example that, or maybe he gave other ones, but the one that I focused on of, it was the silver shekel that the temple bureaucrats used. Wh why did they pick silver? There was no reason in your story for them to pick silver. They could have picked anything. They could have had an abstract unit of account and it didn't need to be physical. Why? And, I, you know, <laughs> and yet he's, they're so confident. Aha, you idiot economist. So anyway, we'll wrap up there. I hope if nothing else, I've given you a lot more detail for the contributions of Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises to monetary theory. And then how you, if you're an Austrian fan, should respond if you encounter some mmt -er in the wild who says that, ah, archaeology and anthropology have totally blown up your silly armchair theory. Thanks for your attention, everybody. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. 
In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org. <laughs>